Good morning, everyone. It's so good to see you, and especially today on Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. I got just a few announcements to draw to your attention. There is a self-defense class that is going to be on Friday and Saturday of July. Did I get that right, Karen? For July, right? The self-defense class? Yes. July the 26th and 27th. It's going to be at 5.30 to 7.30 um, on Saturday, or on Friday, and then 10 to 3 p.m., in, so 10 in the morning to 3 p.m. on Saturday, um, ages 10 and up, it's $40 per person or a family of three to four, it's $80. So just keep that in mind that there's that self-defense class that's going to be coming up in July. Also, um, there is a cowboy, the cowboy church is having a men's gathering. It's called Men of Iron, um, Follow Me from Ephesians 6. 13. It's going to be on Saturday, June 22nd from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. It's um, $25 a person. Food and drinks are provided. It's out at the Double M Ranch Sale Barn facility. Um, and the information for that is here on this paper on where the address and everything is. And I'll post that this out onto the bulletin board if that's something you're interested in. It's a men's gathering. It, it ought to be pretty interesting from what Dick was telling me about who the speaker is and um, that it, it would be a good time to gather. Also, just letting you know, we are canceling the business meeting and cookie hour this month because we're not going to have a lot of elders around for the next couple of weeks. So um, we'll, we'll pick it up next, next month. Um, just to draw to your attention. Is there anything else I have missed? Um, if you are helping with CBS, you can come any day after church, 6 o'clock, and make sure that everyone knows what they're doing, and we'll have the CBS folks come out and help you with that. Yes. Um, and we have a Sunday school that's coming up. Also, if you're interested in your children going to Okay, so just a we're going to have a short meeting for anybody helping with VBS um, after service um, because CJ is going to be gone for the next two weeks and just some housekeeping to make sure we all know what we're doing. And we are going to be starting the memory verses for any of the kids that want to go to Cove Christian Camp for them to memorize the verses. And it goes towards um, the church um, giving them scholarships to help cover the camp costs. So... The women's Bible, or Bible study is canceled for the summer. The Tuesday Bible study for Revelation is still on, and we're going to have that um, this coming Tuesday as well. Is there anything else I may have missed? I have a lot more announcements today than I normally do. No? Okay. Will you please stand, and we'll open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much just for this opportunity to come here to, to worship you, to gather together. And Father, we just pray that today our worship will be pleasing coming up to you, that you would draw us close to your heart, help us to learn something new about you and grow in our character and our nature so that we will mirror you. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The joy of the Lord is my strength. 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 He giveth many water, and I thirst no more. He giveth many water, and I thirst no more. He giveth many water, and I thirst no more. And 
3 16 and 17 that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his power and the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith Psalm 139, 17. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the love of them. You may be seated.
Corinthians 2.9. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Good morning. Oh, what day is this? What are we celebrating today? Yes, isn't that wonderful? We have so many wonderful men and fathers in our family here. It's just awesome. So, tell me something about your father that you especially appreciate or enjoy. Your dad, okay. I know, when we can think about it, I kind of caught you off guard. There's a whole bunch of things that we can really appreciate and enjoy about our fathers. I know I rem remember some of the things my dad taught me. You want to know something? The things that I remember the best are the ones I listened to the best and just seem like I learned them. And I've used some of those over and over and over, and it's wonderful. So we kind of need to think and, and think about those things and plan, don't we? Okay, you know, we have another father too, don't we? We have a heavenly father, God, who loves us also. And he wants to teach and train us too. Where do we learn those things? That's right from the Bible. And I know your fathers are trying to teach you those things also. One of the things that he kind of summarized it with, do you know what these are? Excellent. And you know, if you just kind of review these, it, it puts a lot of summary into things that we can learn and use in our lives to keep us well and, and plan ahead and do those things. This one's kind of special to me because my grandmother had the Ten Commandments always in her house, and they looked just like this, so it was kind of neat. What are some of the things that you do to learn? Hmm. Come to sun church, Sunday school, listen. Do you have family times and read the Bible at home sometimes? Isn't that wonderful? You have a Bible, good. Oh, you don't? Okay, we can we can take care of that, but I'll bet your dad will too, okay? We can chill with that. Mm-hmm, I know. I can see some of you children growing and learning in the Lord, and it's wonderful. In fact, some of you answer the trivia questions really well. It's kind of fun. Okay, 
You know, when we are learning things, there's lots of things out there that maybe might be better if we didn't learn, right? Uh-huh. So just to kind of help illustrate that, I brought something today. Uh-oh, sounds like I might have spilled something, but that's okay. These are from my garden. But you know what? Do you know what they are? Roses, yes. I picked them yesterday. They're already looking not too good. But you know what? This rose, and I thought I caught that off, but what do you see there? It's kind of a dead branch. And you know what? The thorns are still rather pokey on that one. But there's some other things, too. And you know, when we're learning, we need to be careful about the things that we learn and not always listen to everybody because we can get told to do some things that aren't really good for us. Um, I hope you don't have any memories of those. I do. Actually, this isn't a rose, if you look close. And you know what? Just in the things that we kind of get exposed to or start doing we shouldn't do, if you will take care of those and weed them. I picked this yesterday because I thought it'd be quick and easy and, you know, just to prune it. And look, it already looks like it's dying. But if you can see, these, this is a wild raspberry. And it took over my raspberry plants to where I couldn't even go in and pick it. And it grew up in one of my apple trees until I lost that apple tree. And then I had to really work last fall and this spring to try and save my grapes because it just started taking over everything. You know what? Sometimes things, bad things that we think of or start to do that aren't the best things for us, can take those things over too. And we've got to be careful on that. And we need to think about what we're thinking and doing and cleaning it up. I think there's one here. In fact, this weed is so bad that it was in the newspaper asking people to get rid of it. It's the poison hemlock. And you can see it all along the creek. It doesn't live too long if you get it cut off, but you've got to cut it off so that it doesn't get any more food, or doesn't we practice it in our lives. Does that make sense? Oh, I dropped these, didn't I? I was picking weeds. Oops, maybe you can't see them there. Well, because I took them off. But when I was out picking weeds and stuff, do you know what foxtails are? Uh-oh, there's another one. The foxtails were so bad, I tried not to bring any green ones in. But they got on my, in my socks and on my gloves. I finally threw my socks away because they just invaded. We have to be really careful about the weeds and things, not only in our gardens and pathways, but in our thoughts and what we do and can think of. Um, in fact, there's a song that I know you'll be singing today. It's, be careful, little mind, what you think. Be careful, little eyes, what you see have to be careful about those things, don't we? So we'll finish with one of my favorite verses, and it's Mark 4, 24. I'm going to use the Amplified, and you can see it up there if you want to. And if you can look at it and read it with me, parents, that would be great too. Mark 4, 24. And God said to them, be careful what you are hearing. The measure of thought and study you give to the truth you hear will be the measure of virtue and knowledge that comes back to you, and more besides will be given to you who hear. You know, that became one of the first verses, because I didn't grow up as a Christian. One of the first verses that really, I just, I just thought of that and loved that verse, because as we learn to give thought to the good things, then we can think and grow and not be as tempted and have so much trouble. And more besides, God loves us enough that more besides will be given to us. In just a moment, you can go with Miss CJ. 
but for the fathers today, because it's Father's Day, oops, there's a glove with plenty of weeds on it. Um, well, you kids already thought, I think. We want dads to be able to prune things off too. So I've got a box of these, and there's a few other tools there. Please, fathers, on your way out, help yourself and take whichever one you'd like, okay? So, kids, you can go with Miss CJ. Thank you for being here, and we'll see you soon. Hmm? Oh. Okay, let's stand as we prepare for communion. First Peter 2.24 Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Good morning. So we all know that it's Father's Day today, right? So I, um, I got up this morning and looked at my phone expecting a text or something from my kids, and I got nothing. <laughs> and I think I was ready to trash talk them a little bit. But now, hold on a second here before, uh, uh, before, uh, before we trash talk them too much. Uh, on Wednesday, my daughter texts me and says, Hey, Dad, here's what we're going to do for Father's Day. And so uh, she covered it. And then my son took me out of dinner on Friday. So I can't really say that they didn't do, they were planning well ahead and everything like that. But, you know, there's sometimes when we just want to cuss our kids. I'm just going to say straight up as a father, sometimes you want to cuss your kid. And uh, I want you to keep this in the back of your mind. At the same time that you want to cuss your kids, you would do absolutely anything for them. 
up to and give your own life. Okay? Just note that. But that's a choice that you will make for your situation. I do want to share something with you. I was driving down the road earlier this week, and I was thinking about communion, actually, and I was listening to uh, 93.3 FM, the Christian radio station. I forget what it's called, Caleb or something like that. And um, they quoted out this, uh, because it was a week of Father's Day, they quoted out this verse um, out of uh, Psalms chapter 103. And so I thought, uh, when I got home, I decided, oh, man, I need to look that up and read it. And so I did. And it was kind of interesting um, what God does with his relationship with his people. And I just want to read some of it. And then I want to jump over in the New Testament, look at a couple different things about father-son relationship and um, make, uh, make the point here. Um, Psalms 103 starts this way. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who pardons all of your iniquities, who heals all of your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things, so that your youth is renewed like an eagle. I mean, here's God talking about his relationship with his people, and these are the benefits that he's giving his people on a regular basis. And, and I mean, it goes on. It says, the Lord performs righteous deeds and the judgments for, uh, and judgments for all who are oppressed. And he made known his ways to Moses, and he acted, and he acts to the sons of Israel. And the Lord is compassionate and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in love and kindness. Not like me, who wanted to cuss his kids because they didn't text me. Okay, just saying. Um, but he goes on, he will not always strive with us, nor will he always keep his, his, nor will he keep his anger forever. And that's something to think about. Um, he has not dealt with us according to our sins, uh, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness towards those who fear him. And now as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. And then he says this, and just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. And I just, it was just amazing to hear all those things about um, how the Lord loves and cares for his people, how the Lord loves and cares for us. And, um, you know, um, but I was still thinking about a father-son relationship here. And, and I know that the father God has a relationship with his son, and this is where it gets a little bit tough to, to speak for me, because I know my son, love my son, absolutely. I would never ask him to do something that would hurt him. I just, I just wouldn't, I couldn't do that. Even if it benefited someone else, I just, I, I couldn't do that. And yet, Father God asks his son to go to the cross, not for his son's sake, but for his father's sake and his father's relationship with the world he created. Wow, that's a little bit heady. You're going to a place that most fathers don't want to go. And it's kind of interesting, the response that we see from the Son is, is powerful. Because we see in Matthew chapter 26, verse 39, in the Garden of Gethsemane, before this is all going to happen, Jesus and his Father are having this conversation. And here's what Jesus said. He says, and he went a little beyond them, and he fell on his face, and he prayed, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. And yet, here's what he does. Yet not my will, but as you will. The father asks Jesus to sacrifice everything. His life. 
so that you and I could have a relationship with the Father and with the Son of the Holy Spirit. And I just, I just think on Father's Day, it's like, wow, the fact that God loved us so much, so much more than you or I would ever be willing to go. I'm sorry. I, I'm not going to sacrifice inside. I, you know, I, we go back and talk about Abraham um, taking Isaac up and, and, and offering a sacrifice and all that stuff. I'm sorry, I, I, I couldn't do it. I'd love to say I'm strong enough. No, that's nothing I'm ever going to do. I just, I, I'm looking at it, it's like, no, no. And I keep saying, no, no. And, and I can't imagine God standing up in heaven watching his son sacrifice himself on the cross for relationship for us. For me. And I'm not that good. I suspect the rest of the world is the same. It's like, wow. And then we go over to Philippians chapter 2. In chapter 2 here, starting verse 1, Paul was talking about how we should be as Christians. And here's what he says. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ there is any consolation of love if there is any fellowship of the spirit if in if any affection and compassion make my joy complete by being of the same mind maintaining the same love united in spirit and intent on one purpose here it is do nothing for selfish or empty conceit but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. And here's what Jesus did. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God, as something to be grasped. But being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You know, we can't gloss over this, this sacrifice that he made. Yeah, he's God. He's going to raise again on the third day. We know this. But he did this not for his own he did this for his own. He loved each one of us that much that he would consider us his children. That's, that's kind of powerful. Um, this morning when we take communion, we commemorate his sacrifice that was made on the cross. The Bread represents his body that hung on the cross. The juice represents his blood that was shed on the cross for the sins of many, for my sins and yours. And let us remember that this morning as we partake. And the power and love of God for his people, that he would love them as his own. Let's pray. Precious Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much that you are a God who redeems. That you looked at us in our wretched state and you were willing to make sacrifices so much greater than any of us ever would that um, you would redeem us with your great love we thank you for you we thank you for your son jesus who sacrificed himself on the cross so that we could have a relationship with him and you in the spirit we thank you so much for that. We thank you so much for your blessings, your mercy, and your grace. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.
morning again. So good to see you. I, again, we're still not going to get done with Romans yet because Father's Day popped up and, and so I, I had some different ideas on where I wanted to go with that. And I came up with something a little interesting as I was studying and going preparing for this sermon. Um, Din Guptil once shared with um, this information, and it has a few tweaks for me added into it because I had to change some of the the places that he referred to because he lives in a different area than than we do. So this is some really interesting information. He says, it seems that that we are constantly being bombarded with images of battles being fought around the world. There hardly seems to, to be an evening that goes by without the news telling us of another armed conflict that is being fought over real estate, religion, or resources of some type. And we hear about it so much that we have almost actually become immune and numb to the reports. After all, that type of war is over there and not over here. But there is a battle being fought today. Not in Iraq, not in Ukraine, not in the Middle East, not in Israel, but right here in Hepner and in Lexington and in Lone Rock. In fact, this war is raging all over the United States in every nook and cranny. You could even go further and say the world. And it has nothing to do with the Taliban, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Iraq, China, or even Russia. It's a battle that every Christian will have to fight with. And that fight is with the forces of evil and everything ungodly. You know, we've become quite sophisticated in 2024. And the concept that there is a battle raging between good and evil seems, well, seems quaint and like an old-fashioned topic. You know, one of those types of topics that you would explore in an old episode of The Twilight Zone or The X-Files, but certainly not here in our own lives. And I bring this up because today is Father's Day. And before I dive into the sermon for today, I first want to extend a very heartfelt thank you to all the fathers and father-like figures that are here today. You are truly appreciated, so thank you for all that you do. Now with the pleasantries out of the way, we come to a very hard and real topic and truth that, that we need to come to understand. We need more fathers willing to get involved with their families. And we need more fathers and father-like figures to demonstrate in this world what it truly looks like to be a godly father and what we as dads should be striving for. You see, the fact is a war truly is waging, and even today Satan is trying the best he can to draw as many people to him as possible and away from the truth of Jesus Christ. That is why for today, I would like to focus on the fact that that we all as Christians, especially us as fathers and men, need to take a step back from all the distractions in life so that we can always be prepared for the battle raging over our families. So if you haven't already, will you please open your Bibles to Proverbs 20, chapter 24. We're going to be reading verses 5 and 6. Now for, the, for today, this will be our main scripture. However, as we dive deeper into these two verses, we will also be drawing from quite a few other scriptures as well. So with that being said, as you're getting to Proverbs 24, verses 5 and 6, we see that it says, a wise man is strong 
and a man of knowledge increases power. For by wise guidance, you will wage war and in abundance of counselors, there is victory. So as a backdrop, this text perfectly embodies what a faithful and godly father and man is to look and act like. We come to see that a father is to be wise, seeking for the counsel of other faithful, wise Christians to truly be successful in leading his families or our families, while at the same time standing strong, never forgetting that that love is at the center of everything we do, but yet we are strong. Now, it's important to mention that, that though our focus today is primarily on fathers and, and men, the fact is that each point today can and does apply to all of us, both male and female, young and old. Which leads me to the first key point for today, which if we were to take all the characteristics of Proverbs 24 verses 5 through 6 and narrow in on the heart of what is being said, we first come to see that a father must always be a threat. Yeah, how often do you hear that in church? You get to be a threat. A father must always be a threat. And you might be wondering why I specifically chose this wording. For as Christians, Jesus calls us to display our love to one another, which is true. However, we also learn that we are in a dangerous and lethal war as we live in this life. And sadly, a lot of the casualties that happen are from our very own families. So to fully flesh out the first point for today, it is crucial that we first jump all the way over to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, which says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with the truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having sawed your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helm of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God with all power and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert, all perseverance and petition for all the saints. So here we see that Paul makes a slight change in his tone and focus in the letter of Ephesians. His tone becomes more militant in nature as he teaches that, that we as God's followers, we as his church, and especially his fathers and men leading the church are most certainly caught up in a battle against evil. Paul expresses to us that, that we need to courageously resist evil through God's strength while being prepared to endure and resist the enemy's attacks while protecting others. So when it comes to being a father, if, if we were to boil down the heart of what Paul is getting at here, it would be that as Christian fathers and as Christian men, because we are at war, we need to be prepared to always be a threat to the enemy through Jesus Christ so that we can properly and faithfully protect not only our wives, our children, but also our fellow brothers and sisters in the church as well when the time comes. That's why in Proverbs 24, men are called to be strong and wise. Simply put, as, as Paul is expressing here in Ephesians, we see that as God's church and as good fathers, we are to be strong in the Lord. In fact, it's safe to say that all Christians everywhere are to be strong in the Lord. 
because we are all part of the universal body of Christ from the, the formation of the church all the way back in Acts to today. All of us who make Jesus Lord of our lives are now soldiers in God's army. And as soldiers of God, we need to understand and embrace the tools required for us as God's church to be successful, especially when it comes to a father's role in the church and in our family's lives. We as fathers are called to be courageous and fearless warriors in God's kingdom. We don't shy away from the fight. Instead, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we become mighty protectors who will not hesitate to defend others from the schemes of the evil one, as shown by Paul in Ephesians verse 11. The devil is continually scheming against us. That's a fact. The devil is looking for opportunities to destroy our families, our wives, our kids. Therefore, it is crucial that godly fathers must always be a threat. We must step up to the call of being protectors for the weak and the innocent, especially within the church and our families. We must be so connected to the Lord in faith that when the enemy looks at us, he shudders in fear, knowing that we are strong and will do whatever it takes to see that nothing and nobody will harm anyone in the family of God, especially in our very own families ourselves. So to help us do this, to help us be a threat to the forces of evil, we see that we are commanded by Paul that we must put on the armor of God. If you notice in the imagery that he's talking about with the armor that he is talking about, it's like a Roman centurion's armor. And nothing in that armor refers to retreat. Everything is to protect the front as you go forward. And we need to put that armor of God on because only God's armor is what gives us any true defense and offense against Satan. Only God's armor prepares us properly for the battle we will face. But what are we defending against? In verse 12, we see that it, it says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of the darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. We are not at war with people. But we are truly at war with the spiritual forces of evil behind anyone that isn't following God. See, it's not the people, it's the forces behind them. And though people can most certainly be used by the enemy, in which we always need to be ready to, to protect others from harm, we also need to be willing to see that the, uh, the other people are like captives and slaves being used and manipulated by Satan. Meaning in this war, when people are being used to attack us through the power of Satan and his forces, they're also captives needing to be saved and freed from his icy grips. This imagery helps us to better understand why we are called to love our enemies and why we are called to pray for them. Our real battle is against spiritual forces that can manipulate others. And in doing so, manifest them into very real attacks against us, leading not only us but our families into a real physical and spiritual danger. So we must be prepared and ready to act as Christ calls us and here in Proverbs, we learn that men are to be strong and wise about the very real threats coming at us and coming at our families. Preaching today tells the story of some interesting things about Abraham Lincoln. You see, President Abraham Lincoln's biographer, John Meacham, argues that Lincoln's version of Christian faith was complicated. 
But Meacham also adds, there is no doubt, however, that the, the Lincoln of the White House years became more religiously inclined, attending services with some regularity and meeting with ministers and congregants. Lincoln became more convinced of the sovereign purposes of God who oversees world events. At one point, Lincoln said, I may not be a great man. I know I'm not a great man, and perhaps it is better that it is so. For it makes me rely upon one who is great and who has the wisdom and the power to lead us safely through this great threat or great trial of the Civil War. You see, there is some real wisdom to be gleaned from Lincoln's words. For as it says in James 4, 7, submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The point of this illustration is to show that, that when we all submit to the power of God as his church, fathers and men, when we let the Lord be our wisdom and our strength, we become a very real threat. A very real threat that is so strong that, that Satan can do nothing but run in fear. God's strength is the strength we are to be putting on. And God's wisdom is the wisdom we need leading us. We are not to be relying on our own abilities to get through the fight. <laughs> Eventually, our, our strength and our own understanding will fail. We'll just fail, and we will lose. When we put the armor of God on, though, his strength and his wisdom is now with us. So as fathers and as men, it is crucial to daily gird your loins with the truth, put on the breastplate of righteousness, sod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, taking up the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the very word of God. Because only when we are prepared and ready for battle do we truly become a very real threat to the enemy. Only when we are prepared for battle can we properly protect our families as well as the church from a corrupt and evil world that is desperately trying to harm our families and lead those within the church astray. It is our responsibility, not only as fathers and men in general, to stand in the gap between evil within this world. And we do it for the sole purpose of protecting our church and our families. We protect them so that they can grow up faithfully in the Lord if the world viewed us fathers as a very real threat, they would not be so inclined to try and manipulate and corrupt those we love. For as Jesus once said in Mark 3, 27, but no one can enter the strong man's house and plunder his property unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his home. I know Jesus is talking about some other things, but I'm gonna use this Specific verse, because it talks about something important. Church, fathers, men, everyone. When we put on the full armor of God, we cannot be bound by the enemy. When we put the full armor of God on, we become a very real threat that cannot be overcome because Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our King, and our God is fighting with and for us meaning Satan and all evil will run and hide in fear. Just go to all the different various stories of when Jesus walks by and there's a demon-possessed person. They're terrified of him. That very same Holy Spirit is in us. Fathers, when we choose to put on the full armor of God, and become a threat, that is when we can properly live out what Proverbs 24, five through six calls us to. However, that is not the only thing we can learn today. The, the second key point that I would like to draw our attention to is the fact that as fathers, we need to be constantly present in our children's lives. 
So just as we learned on Mother's Day that a child needs their mother to be present within their lives, today on Father's Day, we also learned that children need their fathers to be fully invested and present as well. Now, this concept of being present in our children's lives is repeated again and again in Scripture. Just take, for example, Proverbs 22, 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Or Deuteronomy eleven nineteen, you shall teach them to your sons, talking of them when you sit in your houses and when you walk along the roads and when you lie down and when you rise up. Even in the New Testament, Ephesians 6, 4, we see that Paul is calling us to fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Or even in 1 Timothy 3, 4 through 5, that says, he must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? Now, the list can just go on and on with the reality that it is vital that fathers need to be constantly present in your children's lives. Do you understand what I mean by that? Because there's that old saying, well, I went to work. I brought home the bacon. That's all I need to do. Uh-uh. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what godly fathers are to be doing. We do more than work. That's part of it. We provide. But we need to be constantly present in our children's lives. For you see, godly fathers lead their families by example. And the only way to be a good example is to be available for your kids to learn from you. We must be willing to take a stand and train our families to know the Lord. You see, a great way that we can do this is by openly displaying our faith in God to our families. It's not a secret faith that we bundle up and keep inside. No, we, we show it. We live it. We let it out around our families, helping them to understand the wisdom of putting faith in God and showing them how to lovingly have a personal relationship with God and how that can save their very lives. You see, we train up our families to know and follow the Lord because as fathers and as men, it is our responsibility. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying mothers don't play a part in this, but today's Father's Day, so we're focusing on fathers. It's not the world's job. It's not society's job. And it's especially not the school's or the government's job to guide our families. As fathers in Christ, as the heads of our families, we are the ones responsible to help our children and our families draw closer to the Lord by living out our faith through our actions and our influence. This is only possible if we are present in our children's lives. You see, the enemy is very crafty, very, very crafty. And he has not stopped trying to rip our rights as parents out of our hands. For if the enemy can diminish the father's role in the lives of his kids, it is so much easier to manipulate and draw our kids away from the Lord. So as godly fathers, we must wake up. We must be present and seek to be the most prominent influence in our children's lives and the lives of our families. Ministry 127 tells how a young pastor in Ohio also worked at a feed processing plant in order to make ends meet. Each night when, when he went home, his boys would look at him and said, Boy, Dad, you're sure dusty. He would grumble to himself, but then smile and say, Yes, I sure am dusty. 
One Saturday morning, as he was washing his car, he looked over and saw his oldest son, four years old at the time, beginning to pick up small stones from the driveway and rub them onto his pants. The father asked, what are you doing? I want to be dusty like you, dad, came the reply. The Lord is calling all fathers to be constantly present in your children's life. That way they can come to know and follow the Lord just as we do. Our kids are watching us. And our influence within their lives is immensely powerful in how they grow up to be who they are going to be and how, who they choose to follow as Lord of their life. We must refuse to stand by and let the enemy and the false promises of this world sneak in and take hold of our wives and our children and our brothers and our sisters and anyone else who could one day become part of the larger family of God. The example that a father brings into the lives of those around them is so powerful, you never know what the whole impact might be. But we as fathers can either lead our families and others away from the Lord based on our own ungodless example, or we can draw them closer to Jesus because we choose to stand in and with the Lord. How much stronger would every church congregation be if every father and father-like figure chose to be bold and courageous enough to fully embrace the role Jesus has called us to? You see, this applies not only to father figures, but to all who make up the church. We all must make the choice to reject living according to the ways the world defines and the way the world wants us to parent. Instead, we need to willfully submit to God's example of fatherhood that Andrew beautifully displayed in his communion meditation. We need to follow God's example of fatherhood so that we can begin mirroring God himself. As it says in Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your father who is in heaven. What an amazing concept to know that, that we can all lead we can all as the church reach others and we can all impact people for the glory of Christ. Godly fathers must be constantly present in our children's lives so that one day our kids can lead and bless others for Christ as well. To live out Proverbs 24 verses five and six, it is crucial that not just fathers and men choose to be that to be constantly present in our children's lives, but the church as well. You see, the church serves a massive role in bringing up the next generation to know, love, and serve the Lord in strength and in knowledge, as Proverbs 24 alludes to. So keep that in mind and sear it to your hearts as we move on to the final point for today, which is expect and trust that victory will come through Jesus. Romans 8.37 helps us to understand this well when Paul says, No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Simply put, don't listen to the world because Satan is the one blinding the world and people from Jesus and his victorious salvation. That is why we see society crumbling all around us. That is why we see the attacks against godly families that have both a mother and a father trying to raise their kids to know the Lord. Sin is at the heart of society right now. And because of that, we see our nation lifting up and praising 
things like homosexuality, transgenderism, pedophilia, sex trafficking, drug use, sex outside of marriage, abortion, and the list goes on and on and on with all the various sins that the world ultimately, with the enemy behind it, is pushing to be the new normal way of living. But Paul tells us in Romans 8, 37, that we are more than conquerors. Satan is working overtime to stop us from believing that fact. For as Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 8, we are called to be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Satan is looking to devour anyone and everyone. So as godly fathers, in fact, just as Christians, it is important that we expect and trust that victory will come through Jesus. We need to turn to Christ, our Lord and our Savior. We need to grow in our relationship and our understanding of who he is and how he calls us to live. We need to mirror Jesus's image out into the world so that others will turn from sin and repent. You see, the world is on the very broad path that Jesus spoke about. But we as Christians are called to stay on the narrow path. So when the world and Satan seeks to draw us away, we instead need to be bold as we stand on the truth of Christ, refusing to conform as we continue to draw in the lost and broken to Jesus. We expect and trust that victory will come through Jesus because we are called by God to draw others out of the world and into salvation and into a true relationship with Christ. When the world demands that we conform to its lies, we need to be like Peter and the other apostles who said, while facing down the high priest in Acts 5.29, we must obey God rather than men. Fathers and father-like figures, church as a whole, we are to live in this world, but not be of this world. Because of that fact, we instead are called to trust and expect that victory will come through Jesus. So don't give in and run away when the world calls us, tries to call us away from God and into sin. We, we refuse to submit and instead stand with Christ as an example, unmovable, with all boldness, completely unashamed and always ready to share the truth in love and peace. That's what we're called to do. We don't run and join the world. We stand in opposition to the lie. I think this short devotional from Colin Harper, Zondervan and Thomas Nelson helps put everything into perspective well. And ladies, you will have to bear with me for a moment because we're about to dive into the male psyche for just a little bit. But if you listen closely, you may just learn a thing or two about how God created us men to function. So with that being said, the devotional says, if you are a hunter, you may already know why some of our founding fathers wanted the national symbol to be the turkey rather than the eagle. As beautiful as they are, eagles are scavengers. The founding fathers were men still taming a wilderness, and they knew this. They weren't easily impressed, but they were impressed with the turkey. If you have ever hunted turkeys, you were probably impressed too, unless you live in Lone Rock. They were unbelievably fast creatures, capable of running 25 miles per hour and flying at speeds up to 20 or 55 miles per hour. They are also smart and constantly on the alert. Hunters like to say a deer thinks every hunter is a tree stump, but a turkey thinks every tree stump is a hunter. 
They can be hard to find, harder to kill, and just to be ornery. Turkeys make themselves hard to clean after they're dead. There are as many as 5,500 feathers on an adult turkey. This is a wild turkey, though. The domesticated turkey is another story. They are idiots, perhaps the dumbest animals alive. Domesticated turkeys will eat themselves to death unless someone stops them. If thunder frightens them, they will often bunch up in one corner of their pen and suffocate each other. Interesting, isn't it? In the wild, turkeys are amazing. When domesticated turkeys are so stupid, they must be kept from accidentally killing themselves a dozen different ways. Fathers, let's admit it. Most of us are tragically over-domesticated. We have hardly any connection to the wild or our wilder selves. Words like adventure, exploit, and quest no longer apply to us. It's why if we are being honest, we have become soft, whiny, and bored. You see, the reality is as men, sometimes we need to just bark at the moon. You see, sometimes we just need to blow something up. Men need to push themselves into a zone they don't control. That, in fact, isn't actually a zone. Men need to go in pursuit. They need a quest. Men and fathers, do you remember the last time your heart raced? You sweated like a pig. You thought you might die. You conquered something. And you bored your band of brothers to death by describing it over and over again. Go do something like it again. Just don't get arrested. <laughs> Simply put, fathers, don't ever underestimate the influence you have in this world. In fact, every one of us who are a part of the family of God are called to join the fight. It doesn't matter if you're male or female, old or young, you don't have to be a parent to step in to the role God is calling us all into. With that being said, allow me to tie this all together and come full circle back to our main text for today. Proverbs 24, five through six says, a wise man is strong and a man of knowledge increases power for by wise guidance, you will wage war and in abundance of counselors, there is victory. To summarize these two verses even shorter, basically, always be prepared for the battle raging over our families. This doesn't just apply to only fathers or men. We are all called to always be prepared for the battle raging over our families. So we all must put on the armor of God so that we can always be a threat to the enemy. We become a constant president in our children's lives so that the enemy will flee from them. And we expect and trust that victory will come through Jesus because only Jesus is the truth, the way, and the life. My friends, the battle is raging on and we have been given our orders. The question is, what will you do? Will you answer the call and become a wild turkey? And always be prepared for the battle raging over our families? Or will you stand by like a domesticated turkey and allow the enemy to devour those that we love? I think the answer is clear, and I think Joshua said it best in Joshua 24, 15. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Just like with Joshua's family, my kids and I will serve the Lord. My prayer and hope for today is that likewise, 
you will all choose to serve the Lord as well. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for what you have taught us today. And we just ask, Father, that you would help us, not just fathers, and not just men, but all of us as Christians, to take seriously the battle that's going on all around us and be willing to stand up and fight so that not only our individual families, but our church families will, will stay protected and united so that we can bring the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and salvation through him out to the world. Father, protect us as we go out. But help us to be bold. Help us to be strong and courageous. For you are the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus. And this world needs to know that. We love you and we praise you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. So at this time, the praise team is going to start making their way forward. And... I would just like to offer an invitation. If you happen to be here and Jesus isn't Lord of your life, and that's a step you're ready to take to make him Lord of your life so that you can put on the full armor of God and be prepared for the world and, and the evil forces that we face. Anytime during this song, you're welcome to come forward. You can sit up here up front. I'd love to talk with you for a little while, and then we, we can move on to the next step, which would be baptism. But for everyone else who's already in the army, are you going to be a domesticated turkey or a wild turkey? That's the question. You don't need to come forward to tell me the answer to that or to tell God that. If you have been a domesticated turkey, it's time to knock it off and start being wild. You can make that decision where you stand. Just make it with the Lord. Please stand as we sing this song. You may all be seated. We got a few trivia, and I have no idea of what they are, so we're all learning something. How many pieces of spiritual armor are listed in Ephesians 6, 10 through 80? Good one. (laughs) I heard four, I heard six. Six. Who or what should people resist according to James 4, 7? The world, the devil. We'll give you the win on that one because I think he's in the world. (laughs) When do you teach your children the word of God? Always. When you sit at home, when you walk along the road, 
when you lie down and when you get up? Who should we obey? We must obey God rather than human beings. Praise and prayers. I have one it, that's asking, we're asking prayers for Tarina Haley's, am I saying? Healy's family for God's hands to be upon all of them at this time and prayers for uh, what's the Sherry Ober did I get that right and her little dog Daisy as she's struggling um, struggling with life so be with Sherry Ober and her little dog Daisy. So those are the two prayer requests that I have. Is there anything else I need to be praying about? Can you remember all the firefighters firefighters this week? Firefighters. Okay. No? Your, your, your family as you're grieving. Yes. And our nation. Service people. people. Let's pray for fathers. Yep. Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to just come before you. First of all, I just want to say thank you. For you are the greatest father. And you have given so much to allow us the ability just to come before you to give you our prayers and our petitions and our concerns and our praises. Father, I want to lift up Tina's family, um, that your hands would be upon them at this time. And also prayers for Sherry um, and her little dog as she struggles with life. And... Father, I just ask that your hands would be upon them as well. Father, I pray for um, Carolyn and her family as they are grieving the loss of her sister, that you would walk them through this time of grief and let them know your peace and comfort. Father, I, I pray for the firefighters, the service people, our nation as a whole. Lord, that your light would just shine down on us and that you would help us to turn from our evil ways to come back to you. Help us as the church, Lord, to be a part of that process. Father, I also want to just pray for all the fathers out there, that you would help us to step into our role fully that you have called us to, to not shy away, but to be strong and courageous. Help us, Lord, to become a real threat to the enemy. Help us not to just be domesticated and off on the sidelines, but to be wild and free following your guidance, your strength, and your wisdom. Lord, I just ask that you bless this entire congregation. Bless your church, your universal church that's all around the world as a whole. Help us be bold and help us be faithful to your mission. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, will you please stand as we sing this final song? out there, go run the race. (laughs) Thank you for coming.